Yeah, no. These are the yellow carrots. You can get some dirt if you eat. <laughs> yeah. These are really good. Yeah, like when you see um, carrot juice as an ingredient uh, for organic foods. In this episode of Wild Roots, we'll go on a delicious adventure through my hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania to uncover the wild roots between the food and the community that raves about it. My mother taught me that home had more to do with people and belonging than four walls and a roof. My dad showed me that food was a love language that calls out to and speaks warmly to everyone. Both of them nurtured in me a love for experiences, travel, and adventure. And somewhere, or maybe everywhere in my travels, I picked up a curiosity about just about everything, everyone, and a fascination with the roots that nourish us, ground us, and connect us to each other and the wonders of the world around us in this one wild and precious life. Fall in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. The leaves are changing, there's a chill in the air, and over the next few days, my best friend Joel and I will follow one of our favorite local chefs around the county to forage and gather local ingredients that will bring his latest food visions to life. We start our adventure in the heart of historic downtown Lancaster with our friend, Chef Ryan McQuillan at Plow. <laughs> hey, Welcome. how are you doing? Good, Great how to are see you? you? Ryan has honed his skills in big cities like Philadelphia and New York, and now he's here in Lancaster. He's bringing his love of food passed down from his Italian mother and grandmother and his curiosity for the outdoors together to create innovative food experiences that play homage to the city's German origins and farm roots. I want to do food that is familiar to people, but you can also like play with it. With this mushroom dish, I'm hoping that we can get some mushrooms and forge them tomorrow and then create them, like do it, like play on fried chicken and gravy, which is a, like an Amish staple in the area. So yeah, yeah. Uh, playing on things like that. I love it. I love that you're staying really connected to Lancaster. Mm -hmm. Like you're elevating the food the way that they do in big cities, but it's still like you just mentioned the Amish, which I feel like yep. a lot of people outside of this area wouldn't think of them yeah. as like culinary inspiration. Yeah. I love that. So where, like, where does that come from? So just walking through the market, like you'll think, see things like pepper jam and you know red beet eggs and different things like that. Yeah. I don't want to do the same food that's been done for you know hundreds of years, but I want to do an ode to that. And, yeah. And put that in our dishes here. I feel like with a name like Plow, it has like that German undertone to it, which sure. is you know in the area, people you feel it when you walk on the streets and feel it in the central market. So. I want certain items to be like showcased in that way. It might be like a red beet egg on our cheese plate, pepper jam, we're doing like a Philly style cheese steak. You know, this is the heritage of the food, but also we're like elevating, like you said. Yeah, I love that it's like the expected, but with a totally unexpected yes. twist every single time. Yeah which is just so cool. Okay, so my next question, like not to be presumptuous or like depend too much on our new friendship, but any chance that we can try some of the new things that you're cooking up? 100%, yes. yeah. And if you're willing, um, I'm gonna get with Alex and we're gonna go foraging for some, uh, hopefully some mushrooms and watercress or pawpaws, so. I'm willing, I'm awesome. so willing. Sweet. First stop on this quest is probably the most predictable. With its roots in the 1700s, Lancaster Central Market is the county's oldest continuously operating public farmers market and a food mecca for the farm to table movement in this area. Local chefs and locals in general consider this a one-stop shop for some of the best bounty in Lancaster. I always love like all of the color. Yes. I love just pick up everything and like smell it. And they, they have great stuff here too. All this stuff's local. 
um, super in season. So if you're like walking through, you'll know, you know, what's coming up, what's what's on its way out, just from talking to them. Yeah. Do you ever have the lemon baked ricotta at S. Clyde Weaver? Yes. Is this so good? It's so good. It's so good. Now their Lebanon bologna, their hot smoke Lebanon bologna is very, very good. Really? It's, yes. Yeah, we used to pick up these like massive logs of lemon and bologna, so yeah. they're like, they look like bazookas. So I've been walking <laughs> back with like three of them when we first opened. So the cool thing about this is you can't get their bologna from like a vendor. You have to go to through them, them to yeah. get it. And their bacon, phenomenal. Yeah. Is that where you're gonna grab bacon? Yeah, I'm probably gonna grab like a pound or two of bacon. Okay. Um, And then uh, Groff's there, his produce is always pristine. Yeah. And he'll put out like, it's almost like art when he puts it out. So like those radishes, like yeah, when he yeah. picks lettuce, it's like the most perfect bunches. It's like Instagram in real life. Yes, it is. <laughs> OG Instagram. Really. Yeah, that's it, that's it. We'll yeah. go this way, we'll hit up Lindendale and then hopefully my cheese order's not massive. <laughs> oh, I might forget. Well, at least you have help, we'll help you carry it. Yeah, have you, we'll you tried their cheeses, cheese. Lindendale? No. Oh, really? No, it's, is that crazy? Um, <laughs> I don't know why they're not famous. Really? Yeah, it's that now good. Now I'm stoked. For all the time we've spent in this market, Chef Ryan can't believe we've missed the Lindendale Market Stand. It's all right. my, my favorite spot. We've been missing out. Coat milk caramel. Yeah, that's really good. Tucked along the outer edge, this unassuming cheese stand is one Ryan calls one of Lancaster's best kept secrets. So it's two Gouda and the top. Yep. Wow, look at that. Does it make you giddy to buy this much cheese? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I've never bought this much. A true family operation, the Lindendale Farm in Ronks, Pennsylvania, produces farmstead milk, cheese, yogurt, and more from a pasture-raised herd of over 100 La Mancha goats. One I really need a sample is what I'm sampling. <laughs> this is the soft age bloomy rind. Okay. It's like a brie. The variation is the ash. The rind forms naturally, so you eat the whole thing. Yeah, all right. This one is the garlic. This is my personal favorite. I love the garlic. Do you like it yes. too? So this yeah. is creamy. You know, you don't have the the aging cultures. You don't have that funk. The garlic and the yeah. lavender, my favorite. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, are very nice. Oh, that's delightful. Then you can see what the hard cheese looks like. We have an underground cave we put in, and you can see like five pound meals, and then they go in the cave, and they're in there for over a year. This is like a Limburger. Oh, oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. Super fragrant. Yeah. Uh, Funky. But because it's washed with uh, bee linens, which is the same as Limburger. That how did you good. how did you start this? When we started to have children, I wanted to raise our children on goat's milk. The milk and the cheese is uh, much healthier than cow. Yeah. And so we got a couple of goats, you know, hand milked. And wow. you always make too much sure. milk than what the children can drink. So my husband started making cheese and That's just awesome. got really good at it. The artisan cheese and goat milk products are renowned in the area. And the Mellinger family's passion for wholesome and delicious food that started with just a few goats and evolved into studying artisan cheese making in Canada and France, building a cave on their Pennsylvania property and growing their passion and their reach with each generation. This is Alex Wanger, and we're convinced that he's an absolute genius. <laughs> In 
2010, as a teenager homeschooled by his parents, Neil and Jane, Alex found a passion for science and sustainability. We're working on a fruit breeding project where we take disease resistant varieties and cross pollinate them to try and come up with fruit that doesn't need sprayed much. Okay. So it's easier to grow organically, so it's healthier for people and the planet. He began converting his family's land into a research farm that has evolved and grown into an absolute wonderland of seeds and sprouts, crops and bees, new life and new ways of eating. There's all kinds of different uses for the wild plants that grow like on the edges of the farm too. And that's how we found the name the Fields Edge for name for the edge effect in ecology where different ecosystems meet. That edge is where you'll find the most diversity in plants, animals, and microbes. And Fields Edge Research Farm is serving as a meeting place for different ideas, crops, and people that is sure to have an effect on the future of farming and eating here in Lancaster County and beyond. Oh my gosh, that's so yum. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's why we love working with chefs like Ryan, because we can grow a plant that does really well here, no pest diseases, and it's like, then what do you do with it? Because there's lots of sustainable crops, but if you don't eat them or have people uh, know how to use them, yeah. they disappear. And mm -hmm. so. Um, chefs are really important to make that connection for folks and to develop recipes and that's why we love working with Ryan. <laughs> yeah, no, I bet. Now, I'm always learning from Alex. So. Alex has become known by chefs, farmers, and restaurateurs as an expert in growing heirloom and exotic vegetables and specialty fruits, some of which date back hundreds of years to the time of Native Americans and early European settlers. October tomatoes are the yeah. best. Ooh, God. So good. You taste how it's still like a little chilled inside yeah. from being cool this morning. Yeah, it's so oh fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Other produce growing on Alex's farm come from Africa, Asia, and Europe. Most of what's growing is not considered mainstream, but may hold the keys to more sustainable growing and farming. And it's super important for farmers too, because a lot of those plants don't need the same care that lettuce would. Right. And so in an era where we do have to worry about climate change and lots more pests and diseases and feeding lots of people, having more diversity in crops gives farmers more options and they often require less care than um, like a field of romaine lettuce would. Sure. And that's part of why we started doing this too, is like what are some of the other possibilities? What other things could we be eating that are good for the soil and good for people? We were ecstatic to find a harvest of the elusive Susquehanna banana, also known as pawpaws on the farm. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> They do it, Chef. Yes. <laughs> These all came from near the Susquehanna. The ones that are a little less ripe have more of like a pronounced cotton candy sort of banana flavor. <laughs> and then it, it gets really to be a little good. more tropical as they get ripe, more and more ripe. Who wants the first taste of pawpaw? Paw? <sighs> just like bite right into it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. First pawpaw paw experience. Oh my God. That is delicious. Mm hmm. What? It's like Pennsylvania went on a tropical vacation. Yes. <laughs> but really, it's been here the whole time. Oh, yeah. Do we have that recorded? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got that. Paw Paw Colada. Oh, <laughs> that'd be great. I'm there. <laughs> the smoothie machine. Right? Yes. That should be a total thing. Right? Mm hmm some kind of a cocktail. This is delicious. As a foodie himself, Alex loves the inspiration and challenge he gets from his friendships with innovative chefs from Lancaster to Philly to New York. I love the creativity that Ryan described and it really translates well when we introduce something that's new. Those are the kind of things that chefs have taught us and um, that's what we love, why we love working with Ryan because he's always coming up with new and creative ways to use things and to us, a field's edge farm is a cross-pollination of seed keeping and sustainability, produce and philosophy, harvest and hope. Whereas more than 60% of Lancaster County's landscape is farmland, over 20% of the landmass in Lancaster County is forest.
wetlands and nature preserves, trails and thickets, game lands and backwoods, boasts sycamores, maples, oaks, elms, willows, and other native trees stretching their branches high above the mountain ranges and sprouting treasures down by their roots for us to find and forage. We're looking for oak trees. Yep. And if there's some dead oak around, that's a good sign too. Pretty much you want to look at the base of the trees for the ones we're looking for. But some of the cat mushrooms you got to be really, really careful with. Yeah. Yeah, I heard, I'm pretty sure these are the edible boletes, but we never mess with them yeah. because there's some that'll really mess you up yep. too. <laughs> yeah, if they have pores instead of gills, they're a lot safer. There's some poisonous species of puffball. Yeah, we don't mess with the puffballs just because if you get it wrong, it's pretty serious. Foraging in its simplest form is the act of looking for food in the wild. Interest in foraging has been on the rise since the COVID-19 pandemic, but even before the lockdowns, foraging was becoming something of a trend for upscale foodies and survivalists alike. Mushrooms like the fruit, the fungus is the living part. And once you see a mushroom, it's fruiting. And so I, uh, that's usually how we do it too. We cut and leave a little bit. Yeah. Because it's kind of like ripping the whole apple branch off to harvest the fruit. Yeah, Versus if exactly. you cut it, you don't harm the living growing mycelium then. Oh, here's another one. Yeah. That almost looks like a honey mushroom, but that's yeah. another one. <laughs> I've never had someone teach me how to identify that kind. As for Alex and Ryan, they were taught about foraging by parents and grandparents and their shared love of food and the outdoors, as well as their knowledge and experience makes them our perfect guides. My grandfather was really into hunting and like fishing and stuff. So he kind of got me into the outdoors. The first chef they worked for, he was like really into foraging and stuff. So the restaurant I worked at was right along the Delaware River and the canal area. And there's tons of like morels, shiitakes we would find. So that's kind of what got me into it. We had an old timer who showed us how to forage morels and that was the introduction. Okay. And he didn't have anyone in his family who wanted to learn how. So he was like super excited, Matthew and I, my brother and I wanted to learn and um, that's how we got out in the woods. <laughs> Although it did take a while to find what we were hunting for, it didn't take long for us to catch on to the thrill of the hunt and the glee in the find. So let's see. Yeah, I think they're, that's it. I think. Nah, is that a tree? Oh, I can't Is tell. that leaves? Yeah, I think it's leaves. Oh, that was exciting for me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> oh, look at on this tree. Oh, shoot, bro. Are they jack-o'-lanterns or chickens? I think they're jack-o'-lanterns. Yeah. There were chickens on this tree. Yeah. Though. But I think these are jack-o'-lanterns. That's what they are. These have gills on the bottom. That's how you know they're not what we're looking for. Supposedly they glow in the dark, but we never came at night. Oh, really? They give you a belly ache, but they're a cool mushroom. Ah, oh, that's disappointing. I thought yeah. we'd get one for you there. So if you're not finding what you're looking for, are you assuming like they've been foraged already or that they're just not growing here? I think they're not growing yet. Cause yeah. when other people have been there, you can like there, you'll see the cuts. Um, that yeah. somebody's harvested them or... You'll see like a big, like it looks like a sponge on the side of a tree sometimes, it's, or just like white or like dark brown, and you'll you'll be able to notice. Yeah. Know. Yeah, well should we try another spot? So yeah, we... let's do it. Yeah, you guys are cool with that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, well, okay, here we go. Yeah. There's a piece of my talkie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like somebody was here first. Yep. Looks like it was cut. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it depends how you're feeling. We could poke through the oaks or we could yeah. just head across the lake to the trail that's not used as much. Like they're definitely trying to yeah. go. Yeah, we're just worried that if we keep on going through here that they'll be picked through. Okay, so foraging, not for the faint of heart. This is our third stop, and we have found a lot of growing things, but none of them are quite what we're looking for. So mushrooms that are inedible or unknown to us, we're kind of leaving be. We did find a couple places where the kinds of things we're looking for probably did grow, but they were already foraged by someone else because foraging is awesome. And 
I guess everyone's catching on. Actually, we're catching on. I think everyone else already knew. So yeah, we're doing the divide and conquer approach to trying to find something because we've been doing this for a lot of hours. I don't think anyone's ready to quit until we actually find what we're looking for. So hopefully we do before it gets dark because Yeah, I'm not spotting anything quite yet. I mean, it's a start. Yeah, I mean, we're finding everything except what we want. I know. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Each time has gotten progressively better. Yep. <laughs> One more spot. For yep. John. <laughs> That's awesome. I like it. Oh, there we go. I think we got one. Oh, yay. That's a nice one, too. Wow. Right? Those are great. This one, I can't get over. That stem is massive. Yeah, that thing is massive. <laughs> it's so meaty. I mean, that'll all be good to use. Wow. Yep, and they call these hens because they usually sit at the base, like a hen would roost. Flavor-wise, I think these are, they're so good. They're like, they taste like bacon. They're really cool. And so this is like the pores are these round um, holes instead of the long gills. Okay. That's like what you needed to want to keep hunting. Exactly. Yeah, this is what we're looking for. <laughs> this is usually what happens. You find something like this and you can't stop. Uh, yeah, you get addicted. I'm just going to go up over here real quick too. If you guys are cool with it. Yeah, of course. Oh, wait. I found another chicken. Nice ones. Really nice ones. Gold mine. Now this is what they normally look like, and these are really healthy. These are these are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, you saw some beefsteak mushrooms. Yeah, I didn't pick them yet. They're down there. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's definitely a beefsteak mushroom. See the marbling like meat. Yeah, when it's like super ripe and cut into it, it looks like it's kind of like bleeding. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Tastes like tartar. Yeah, they're a little bit harder to find, so this is exciting. Yeah, this is a rare one. Well, we found about every fall mushroom highlight today so yep the best yeah. uh, foraging trip you could ask for it yeah <laughs> agreed showed you the frustration <laughs> you like all, all the moments the of foraging <laughs> Plow, we're taking in the big city ambiance of this little city restaurant with its open kitchen concept and beautifully appointed dining areas. Open in 2019, Plow has quickly become a mainstay for locals and visitors alike and set itself apart as a modern American kitchen with innovative takes on heirloom staples and unexpected twists on familiar favorites. We try to keep it true to the name of Plow, just being not only local, but just being very seasonal. You know, yeah. Everything on the menu is not forage in the woods. I wish it could be, but um, <laughs> we try to keep it as local as possible. That's awesome. It's important to us. That's awesome. If you're like me, a good story can be as delicious as a chef curated meal. And now, cleaned up and back at Plow, experiencing Chef Ryan's creations with all that we know about the people and land and adventure behind each dish makes every bite even more satisfying. For our cheese plate, we're kind of highlighting Lindendale Creamery. We're doing a cranberry chef, and then we're doing our tome, and then we have an herb-infused cheese as well from them. Our children are eighth generation, and you know, knowing you're on our farm. And yeah. I love that. That same passion as their dad. For our pasta course, we made some pumpkin infused pasta that we did with some Fields Edge Farm kabocha squash. And then we have a little bit of Swiss chard in there, some roasted kabocha, and a little bit of uh, some of that same tone that you had earlier from Lindendale Farms. Kabochas in here. Oh yeah, they're nice. <laughs> it's a lot more dense and um, I think like a richer flavor. Do you want to tell us a little bit about each dish? Yeah, like 100%. how you tried to do it? So with the chicken in the woods, did a, a little bit of a tempura batter with a little bit of buttermilk. Mm -hmm. And then we dredge them in there and then deep fried them. That batter is crazy though, it's so good. Mm -hmm. 
nuts or mushroom soup with the shiitake mushrooms that we got from Alex. Yeah. Some more of the stems from the maitakes, and we um, we made a mushroom stock, and then we mm. just blended together. It's like a classic French technique. So and then we have some of the hen in the woods that we sauteed up and charred rosemary foam. Mm. Oh, that's delicious. <laughs> I mean, you can totally praise your own food. I think that's fine. No, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Mm. This one I'm probably the most excited about, the beefsteak mushroom that Alex found. We treat it just like a steak. We rubbed it a little bit of olive oil and then grilled it. And then we did a tamari butter and glazed it. And then we topped it a little bit of uh, our poblano chimichurri. I can't get over the texture of this. Literally so reminiscent of like a steak. Mm-hmm. No, that's really good, I will, I will say. Wow. It's wild to me how, like, each mushroom really does have its own, I mean, I know you're yep. doing different things Textures to it, and, but there's, like, its mm -hmm. own quality, which I think is so fun. What Chef is doing at Plow is such a beautiful representation of both the history and the future of the farming and foraging culture and community that sets Lancaster County apart from the other places we visited. We're lucky to live in an area where the woods are always changing and there's so many different things out there that the more educated you get, the more you can find. Sure. It leaves me wonderstruck how much potential there is mm -hmm. in this area. There's a magical connectedness between a location, its food, and its people that transcends space and time, experience and memory. As for us, after this experience, we'll never look at our food and forests, farms and friends here in Lancaster the same way. We're excited to explore the roots of every place we wander to. It's the wild roots that hold us all together, inspire and nourish us all along the way. think about this one? Oh, it almost looks like a wine cap or a shiitake. It's a shiitake. It is a shiitake. Yeah. I was going to say. It's from the farm. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see if you could recognize He's the good. mushroom. Uh, it does, like, like the color does look it's like a like wine It looks like a cultivated mushroom. Right? <laughs> I just found that I was going to be like, there was a whole slew of them over there. <laughs> like, that's what, that's what you're doing. Why did I ever take off your microphone? <laughs>